Good evening, New Prospect. Welcome to Wednesday Night Prayer and Bible Study. We want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. If we have any first-time guests or visitors, welcome. Thank you for sharing your evening with us. Uh, we would love to share more information with you about who we are, what we do, and what we believe. Uh, we invite you to check out our website as well as our Facebook page. Uh, you can find a lot of information there. But if you still have questions, reach out another way. Send us an email. Give us a phone call. We would love to answer any questions you might have and share next steps on how you can get involved with our family of faith here. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Before we jump into Bible study, we do want to just open it up for a time of prayer. Uh, we would love to be praying for you. Uh, we want to be praying for this great community that we call home. Uh, perhaps you have a request you would like us to be lifting on your behalf. If you can simply respond to this Facebook post or you can uh, reach out another way and, and make us aware of that. But we would love to be praying for you uh, tonight. Uh, at this time, let's go ahead and take a look at tonight's prayer list. Concerning our prayer list this week, let's please remember uh, Mrs. Doris Dalton, Mrs. Dot Mitchell, and Mrs. Barbara Hill uh, during their times of hospitalizations uh, and, uh, and rehab facilities as well. We have many members at home. Let's continue to remember each one during this time of need. We have lots of family and friends this week. We did add two names uh, to this list this week. We have added the name of Miss Casey Shelton and Mrs. Jackie Britt. Let's please remember uh, those ladies uh, during this week as well. We're expressing sincere Christian sympathy to the families of Mr. Ray Bruffy Jr., Mrs. Ida Compton, Mrs. Virginia Harris, Mr. John David Hedrick Sr., and Mr. Guy Toller. Please remember these families as they grieve the loss of a loved one this week. Our homebound of the week is Mrs. Ella Lane, and our student of the week is Ian Garner. Please lift them in prayer. Send them a note. Send them a card. Send them a text message. Let them know that we are thinking of them and lifting them in prayer. Let's also remember those on our at-home list and those in autumn care, as well as in other assisted living facilities across our area. So many in need of our prayer this evening. Would you join me uh, as we go to the Lord? Lord, we come to you today and we thank you for another opportunity to gather together as a family of faith. Lord, whether it is uh, in person or online, Lord, you know the concerns of our hearts. So we lift them to you now. Uh, Lord, the names and the needs are many. But Lord, uh, you are uh, all-knowing and uh, Lord, we trust in your healing hand. We trust in your comforting arm. Lord, we trust in your will. And so, Lord, we just ask your blessing upon each one, Lord, that they would feel you, uh, your presence. Uh, they would feel your presence in their lives, Lord, that they would, uh, Lord, just cling to you for all peace and understanding, for all guidance and direction during these difficult times. So, Lord, we ask your blessing upon each one. And now, Lord, as we dive into your word, Lord, we pray that you would continue to uh, speak to us. Lord, that we would learn more of your great love for us. Lord, that you would continue to equip and prepare us to be your hands and feet. Uh, Lord, in the lives of uh, those listed here on our prayer list and, Lord, the ones that aren't. Lord, throughout our community, Lord, that we would be prepared to share your love with others. And, Lord, that uh, folks would see you in us. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We love you. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Good evening. It's uh, good to be back with you. Uh, we took a break last week to do our Alma Hunt mission study, uh, which Ann Short presented to us and did a very good job. If you haven't had the opportunity to give uh, to the Alma Hunt Offering for State Missions, I encourage you to do so, especially if you are uh, members of New Prospect Baptist Church. Um, it uh, goes for many good causes. You can look it up on the BGAV, Baptist General Association of Virginia uh, website, and it can give you information to all the things that helps uh, support 
One of those being disaster relief. And of course, with all of the things that have taken place uh, in our country, the, the natural disasters that have occurred over the past couple of months, uh, even now, Virginia Baptist feeding units have been deployed to uh, help relieve suffering. So I encourage you to do that. But we're back here on Wednesday, and we're studying the book of James. Uh, I think it's a book uh, of the New Testament uh, that is very uh, characteristic of the Proverbs or the wisdom literature. If you were to say there's one book in the New Testament uh, that seems to be drawn out of the Old Testament's uh, wisdom tradition, it would be the book of James. Seems very Jewish in that way. And tonight I'm going to have us read uh, James chapter 3 verses 1 through 12, but we're, we're basically going to focus on verse 1 and maybe bleed over into verse 2. So I hope you have your Bibles and you have them open to the book of James, uh, chapter 3. Beginning with the first verse we read, Not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says... He is a mature man who is also able to control his whole body. Now, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we also guide the whole animal. And consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how large a forest a small fire ignites. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among the parts of our bodies. It pollutes the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is set on fire by hell. For every creature, animal or bird, reptile or fish, is tamed and has been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, each time we open your word, we are reminded of what a treasure it is. It is full of good instruction, not only helping us to be wise, but preparing us in our journey of following Jesus. Jesus, when he went to the synagogue, was handed the scroll of Isaiah and read from it. And we know, God, that when Jesus taught, he often reflected on the Bible of his day, what we call the Old Testament. We pray, God, that tonight we would approach this word in a way that would be fitting of the gift it is from you, and that we would seek to learn from it. And once we have learned from it, we would desire to apply it to our own lives so that we can be the people that you have called us to be, reflecting your character to the world. Now go with us, Lord, as we continue in this study. Bless us so that in turn we can be a blessing to others. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as we were reading, it became very apparent that there has been a shift in theme uh, or subject matter uh, from chapter 2 uh, to chapter 3. 
back in chapter 2, we were dealing uh, with the, re the relationship of faith to works. Uh, and you'll recall that back there we weren't saying uh, that, that, you know, faith is the opposite of works. Uh, but we were saying that what James was emphasizing there uh, was that when you have faith, it will produce works. And so it's not a case of either or, it's a case of both and. And now we have shifted our focus. And in chapter 3, the first part of it, uh, the, the focus is on uh, the tongue. Now, and then if you look specifically, uh, that's, that's what's found in, in most of uh, verses 1 through 12. But if you look at it specifically and you go back up to uh, verse 1 and 2, which will be our focus today, you will discover it is the focus of the tongue in the use of the task of teaching, its use in the task of teaching. And it is very clear that the very first part of verse 1 comes to us almost as a warning. Not many should become teachers, my brothers. Now, some of you may have been reading uh, tonight from the authorized version, better known as the King James Version. And if you were, that word that is translated in the Home and Christian Study Bible as teachers may have been uh, read, you might have read it as masters. It is really uh, reflective of the teaching task. And the thing that we do know is that if you go back to the first century, <coughs> excuse me, where James is coming out of, the, the, the culture, the times, uh, you know, that he is coming out of, that in not only the Christian church, but in Judaism, that teachers had and played an important role in the life of faith. Uh, we know this uh, because of the fact that when you, when you went to the synagogue, most of the times you, you were taught. And, uh, and in many instances, Jesus himself is referred to as a teacher or a rabbi. And he would get around himself, his disciples. Almost every uh, teacher in that day, uh, no matter if he was uh, a Jew or, or a Gentile, many, many teachers, if you go back even into the, the Greek world, they would, they would get, gather around themselves disciples. And the only thing a disciple is, is one who tries to uh, be taught or the attempt of, of learning what the teacher has to say. And we know in the church today, that the role of a teacher is vitally important. Um, the the teacher in our churches, if you if you go in uh, New Prospect, if you come here, you know that our teachers play the role of trying to uh, take a a scripture passage and impart the truth of it to the people who have gathered in their Sunday school class or on Wednesday nights. Um, a lot of times, like, like tonight, what we're doing is teaching. I'm teaching. And uh, there's a women's group, and they gather together, and they usually go through a discipleship study or, or a teaching study, and they're trying to learn. They're trying to become learners. And so what that is trying to do is, is impart the truth of the faith in such a way that what is learned will impact lifestyle. And this is exactly the desire of the book of James, because as we've said before, uh, James is very reflective of wisdom literature. And if you go back to the book of Proverbs, you understand that uh, it is very heavy on what should be taught, but it's always teaching with a desired outcome. One of the probably easiest uh, Proverbs that we remember is raise up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it, right? So, so you see the, the emphasis on, on what imparting 
things, teaching a child, raising a child, and then the, the desired outcome. And so we know that when we teach someone, the, the, it's not just that they can accumulate knowledge, but that they can apply what's learned to their lives. And that's what the emphasis is here. Now we know also that when you go back and you're reading the, uh, the, the New Testament, that the, the gift of teaching or the responsibility of teaching was very important. Because if you go back and you look at it, you will discover that teaching is listed among uh, the leadership uh, positions in the early church. In Ephesians 4.11, Paul lists five leadership gifts. Uh, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, one of the things that we see here is that it's a warning. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, today it can be a struggle to find people who want to teach. Um, it can be. It can be. In the early church, one of the struggles they have is there were too many people who wanted to teach. And so this could probably explain Paul's warning here. Uh, there, there may have been, remember, uh, when it talks, Paul gives those five leadership gifts. He talks about being apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Paul would say that people are called to these positions. They, these are positions that the Spirit gifts for, right? If you go back and you, um, and you read some of Paul's letters, he talks about the Spirit giving the gifts and the gifts are used for the work of the ministry. And it, it could have been that in that day, there were some people who were, you know, they, they, maybe they viewed being a teacher as an honorable position and they wanted to hold the honorable position. And so what they were doing, they were uh, attempting to become a teacher uh, without, uh, without really being gifted for that role. Uh, that, I don't want to use that as, a, a, you know, um, to frighten people away from taking on the task. It's just the realization that in uh, the, the church, uh, there is a need to have people who the Spirit has gifted uh, for the task. Now, he says, not many should become teachers, my brothers. That's the statement. And here's the warning. Knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. Now, it's interesting that, um, that James here uses an inclusive pronoun. He doesn't say, knowing that you. He says, knowing that we. And so it must be that James looks at himself as being a teacher. And quite possibly, as he writes out uh, this letter, uh, that he is looking at it as being part of his teaching task. And, and we, we do know uh, that sometimes that takes place. Paul was a teacher himself, uh, and he wrote letters uh, to churches as part of his teaching responsibility. You, you go back and you uh, look in, uh, in in some of Paul's letters and you know that he is following up some teaching uh, 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 that, that he has already been uh, teaching on. Uh, look um, uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians. He says, about brotherly love. Okay, what's he, about, what's he about to do? You don't need me to write to you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. But who else has taught him? He, he goes on to teach them, but we encourage you brothers to do so even more, to seek to lead a quiet life. He says, this is what brotherly love looks like, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, as we commanded you. He's already taught about brotherly love. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest 
who have no hope. Okay, so what's he about to teach on? He's about to teach on the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so Paul himself understood uh, what it meant to be a teacher. And so he didn't just teach when he was in person with people. He taught through the communication of letters. And, and sometimes, you know, that's uh, any, uh, a lot of forms. Sometimes people teach today uh, online. Uh, you know, uh, they might post a blog. I know there's uh, some pastors uh, in the Stanton River Baptist Association and, and uh, other denominations in this area. And, and they do a, a blog on, on, on the Internet. People go and they read it. And it's a teaching blog. So there's different ways of teaching. But whether, the, whether you're teaching verbally or, or, or whether you're teaching through the communication of the written word or typed word, whatever you want to call it, um, the task is a very important one because you're going to be judged by what you say and what you write, knowing that we will receive stricter judgment. Now, James is one who is trying to exercise the gift of teaching in a way where he understands the responsibility. You know, if you're going to be judged for doing something, it is because you know that the thing is important. You know that what you're about to do is very important. Now, how would you, how would you describe the importance of the, the, the teaching task? Uh, I, I like what A.T. Robertson, A.T. Robertson is uh, a long time ago, a uh, Greek scholar. And he compares the teacher to a spiritual surgeon. He, sa he writes, for they deal with the issues of life and death. Um, and, and so, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting thing that if he's, if, if you go to, have a surgery done you want to know that the person who is going to do that surgery has been well trained that they're learned about uh, the the part of the body that they're going to operate uh, on you about you know that they that they're skilled in it that they're going to remove the right thing and not the wrong thing uh, and that once they have completed it that and you're sewn up that this will bring health to you and and the outcome will be good and you will grow strong in your body well the you can see if Robertson is comparing the teacher to a spiritual surgeon that's what he is talking about that this this is a matter of life that you know uh, the Bible is called a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, it, it's talking about, you know, providing a way for us to see forward, you know, to not trip and to stumble, which we'll get into in a few few moments. So, what do we, when we're looking at this and we're looking at the task of teaching, uh, what what should we think about? Well, we should think about one, the stewardship of the gift. Uh, back in um, Luke's Gospel, in chapter 12, Jesus is, uh, he's teaching this, he says, uh, the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sens sensible manager of his master will put in, uh, his master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time. That slave whose master finds him working when he comes will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and starts to beat the male and female slaves, and to eat and drink and get drunk, that slave's master will come on a day that he does not expect him, and in an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the unbelievers. And that slave, who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself or do it, will be severely beaten. 
but the one who did not know and did things deserving of blows will be beaten lightly. Much will be required of everyone who has been given much, and even more will be expected of the one who has been entrusted with more. That last, that last little portion there, that, that verse 48, 1248, is what we're talking about here, the stewardship. Jesus many times reflects on this uh, when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit or the gifts given to a person. Uh, and you remember the story about uh, the, the three, um, three servants and, and they were given these talents to use and, and one's given, I think, ten, one's given five, and one's given one. And the one who is given one, what does he do? He goes and buries it in the ground because he's afraid he will lose it and he doesn't invest it. And what, what that suggests to us, and when we're looking at this, if we look at teaching as a task that is given to us because we have been given a gift, then the stewardship of that gift is what we should look to do. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're um, a 10 talent teacher. It doesn't matter if you're a five talent teacher. It doesn't matter if you're a one talent teacher. What matters is you take the talent you've been given and you do your best to invest that talent so that it produces something for the kingdom of God. So you have that. Now, there, there's this other, uh, you know, a principle, if you want to use it, uh, that, that we find. Uh, and that's the, the one of sowing and harvest, okay? Now... Uh, it's it's interesting if you if you go back and you're looking at Paul's relationship uh, with Timothy, and uh, you you I think we can find it in First Timothy. Uh, Paul is writing his greetings to Timothy. <clears throat> now listen what he says in the greeting, the first part of First Timothy, uh, chapter one, uh, verses one and two. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Now look there. Paul says, I am an apostle, right, uh, a court of Christ Jesus, according to the command of God and our Savior, Christ Jesus. Remember I told you, uh, being an apostle is one of the gifts uh, in the early church. But look what he writes in the, the very second verse. To Timothy... My true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And um, uh, it's, it's one of those things where Paul has sown, sown into the life of Timothy his own teaching. Remember, Paul himself uh, had been, as a Pharisee, uh, a student of the, the rabbi, great rabbi, great teacher Gamaliel. Uh, and, and he had, in turn, taught Timothy in much the same style and fashion as the Jewish rabbis did in his day. And he calls Timothy his true child in the faith. A true child in the faith. That means that he has invested in Timothy's life. Now, the, the fascinating thing is that if you go back and you read um, 1 Timothy or 2 T Timothy, uh, what you will discover is that uh, that he is, you know, he is doing uh, what, what uh, he has been trained to do, the teaching he has experienced. He says, now notice, if you go back to 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1, verse 3, it says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as my forefathers did, when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, remembering your, remembering your tears as I long to see you so that I will be filled with joy, clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois, then in your mother Eunice, and that I am convinced in you also. So, we have official teachers uh, in our faith experience, and then, of course, uh, we have those unofficial teachers who are the first ones to really teach us the faith. Uh, I remember uh, at um, Averick, where I went to school, 
my Old Testament professor, uh, one time was asked, uh, where did you get your faith? In other words, somebody was challenging him and everything else. And, and what he replied is, I, I got it where everyone first gets their faith from my mama. And, you know, that's, that's a lot of truth there. Uh, but teachers, uh, just as uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother had been his early teachers in the faith, and he was, quote unquote, their child, because Paul had taught Timothy, he considered Timothy his, his child in the faith. And if you look in, in our church, and you go back and you, you're privileged to open up some of the old pictorial directories, what is amazing is you look back there and you see many of these little children run, you know, in the pictures. They're, they're part of the first and second grade and, you know, whatever. And they're being taught by these wonderful teachers. Like uh, I, I remember seeing a picture of Oscar Dalton and he was, uh, I, it must have been around Christmas time. And they were taking a picture of his class and he was teaching uh, these young children uh, their Sunday school lesson. And, and, you know, many of the people who Oscar Dalton taught uh, are now leaders here. The one, the one that I think of oftentimes is Betty Maddox and the way she taught. And she was a teacher at her elementary school, but she was a teacher here at New Prospect. And her life influenced the lives of many other people. And they, in turn, have influenced the lives of many other people. So you, you could say... Like, if I look back and I see Betty Maddox, and I know Betty Maddox uh, taught Faye Dalton. And, of course, Faye uh, died about a year ago. But Faye taught many others, right? She taught many others. And then it, it's interesting to see that, that if you want to use that analogy uh, or that description, that Betty Maddox, though she's been gone from... New Prospect for many years. She died, unfortunately, from cancer years ago. But Betty Maddox has grandchildren in the faith. Still here many years later. And, and I, I guarantee you that uh, she rejoices and she rejoiced in that thought that she had invested in the lives of, of, of people like not only Faye but many others. And they, in turn, invested their lives into the lives of others. And, and, and the people you know, who had their lives touched by them are, are still doing that today. So wonderful thought there. So you have the stewardship of the gift. You have the sowing and then the harvest, if you want to do that. And then you have the accountability, uh, which is found also in Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself uh, to God. So what I want, want to tell you is that I don't think... Uh, I, I don't want anybody to say, well, you know, certainly God has not given me uh, the gift of teaching. Because sometimes, sometimes we don't know that we have a gift um, um, until we explore or examine, you know, the opportunities we have to use it. Now, hopefully, most of the people we have uh, teaching here have indeed been given the gift of God and feel committed to that task. But... Let me tell you what happened to me. Uh, many years ago, many years ago, before even uh, my son Mark was born, my oldest child, and uh, Ruth was a youth minister. My wife Ruth uh, was a youth minister at a church called Bethel Baptist uh, in Salem, uh, Virginia. And she was there for two years. So I know what it's like to be uh, the minister's spouse. I've been on the other end of, you know, of all that, so uh, we just sort of changed roles a little bit. Uh, but <laughs> when I went there, one of the things um, that they asked me if I would do, one thing I did, I, I helped lead RAs, Royal Ambassadors, back then. I helped do that. I was, uh, when we went there, uh, let's see, I was 26 at the time, and I was leading a group of youth Royal Ambassadors. But you know what else they asked me to do? They asked me to teach the sixth grade boys class. That's right. Brady, we would like for you to teach the sixth grade boys class. 
so I accepted the responsibility with great fear and trep trepidation. Now, Ru Ruth and I had co-taught uh, the fifth and sixth girls class at my home church, Garden City. But I've got a confession to make. I was sort of the window dressing on I just I was there to help Ruth along because she did most of the teaching unless she was sick. And I filled in if she was sick. But but what happened was, uh, well, that was actually at later. But what happened at Bethel was that I was given the responsibility of, of teaching the sixth grade boys. But I looked on that task. And I was very frightful of it. But every week, every week, Bethel had a time uh, where uh, if you were a teacher, you were supposed to come and and you were to bring your material and you would go over the lesson for that coming Sunday. I can't remember if it was on a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night or whatever. And we would go. And so that's when you began your preparation in your dialogue with other teachers about the lesson. And they would give you input into how to present it to your class. So that's what we did. So I, I would go in there and I would do it. And then I would go into that sixth grade class. I knew one thing, if you're talking about talents, especially at that time in 10, 5, and 1 talent teachers, I know where I was on that, you know, I was a 1 talent teacher. But I knew that I was taking that 1 talent and I was being a good steward of it. I was, because of other people helping me and, and encouraging me, and helping me understand the lesson and how to present it, I was able to present it to the best of my giftedness at that time. And that's what we do. We just, we just do that. We invest it and we use it. Now, in that second verse, now one of the things is there's going to be a trans, uh, there's going to be a transition here, and eventually, you know, we're going to get in next week about the tongue. And uh, it, it's interesting when you're preaching or you're teaching, uh, this is going to happen to you. In verse 2 we read, where we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who is also able to control his whole body. If anyone does not stumble. It's interesting that that word that is used there, is teomen. That's the Greek word. It comes from teo. And teo literally means to stumble, stagger, fall, to make a false step, to err, offend, transgress. And you find it over in James chapter 2, verse 10, and you find it also in Romans chapter uh, 11, verse 11. Now, this word is only used five times in the New Testament. It's a verb. And, uh, but the interesting thing is, I, I pulled out uh, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. K.L. Schmidt in that talks about it almost being this idea, especially in James chapter th 3, verse 2, that um, it, it's like you stumble on the way to falling. But the thing is, you know what? You can stumble and you can get back up or you can stumble and you can stay down. And so uh, the one thing uh, that he is saying, there's a difference between the two. But ponder that for next week's uh, Bible study. We'll try to get more of the verses done next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We're thankful, God, for uh, the teachers uh, who have instructed us uh, in the past. Uh, we're, just, we're just thankful for them. I, I can think on my, my past, I remember uh, the couple, uh, Ronnie and Diane she uh, uh, Shepherd, who were so instrumental, Lord, uh, in my life and when I was a, a young youth. Thank you for, uh, for Diane uh, and uh, Ronnie for taking on that task of teaching me, which I know wasn't an easy one. Uh, I thank you, God, for the opportunity that I have to teach on Wednesday night. 
and to help people as they try to study and learn the Bible. I pray, God, that uh, even if I have not done it as well as others can, that I've done it as best as I can with the giftedness I've been given. And I hope other people, Lord, who feel uh, your calling upon their lives to teach won't be frightened by the warning here, but will be encouraged, knowing, God, that you maybe have given them the gift. And the one thing that we do with our gifts is that we nurture them so that they will grow, and then we will invest them so that others will grow. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in each and every gift that you give us, to invest it in such a way that the kingdom of God will be expanded and that you and Christ will be honored and glorified because it's in his name that we offer our prayer. Amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you uh, next week as we continue in our study of the book of James.